lecture number four. And in lecture number four, we're talking about the discrete time equivalent of a sample data system. This introduces us to a topic called the H transform. So that's what we're going to be looking at today, the H transform. So here we are in our list of topics that we're covering in this unit. So here we are, the H transform. And uh, we're going to continue on. So the important question that we ask in or address in this lecture is how do we discretize a system? How do we take a system like this? So here we have a digital to analog converter, analog to digital converter. Digital to analog converter goes into a continuous time system and that goes into an analog to digital converter. So the input of this is discrete time. The output of this is discrete time. How do we lump all this together and get an equivalent discrete time transfer function? So that's the idea idea of discretizing the system. So here the system takes it, uh, so that's that's the answer, that's the question we're trying to address. So to do that we're going to use the concept of the, the impulse response of a system. So if you recall if we apply an impulse to a, a continuous time system, the output then, uh, if we look at the output then, um, so we recall that the Laplace transform of the delta function is just one. And so when we apply a delta function here, we just get z of s, the, the uh, Laplace transform of this variable, is equal to g of s times delta of s. So that's g of s, which is the Laplace transform of the transfer function. So what we get out is the Laplace transform of the transfer function. And so this is one way of obtaining a transfer function. Okay, so uh, similarly, if, if we're working in the Q domain, we also have this property that the Q transform of a delta function is also 1. And so again, uh, when we apply a delta function to a system, the output is just the, the Q transform of the transfer function. Okay, so we have some input, that delta function we're going to apply to some system and get some output, and we're going to actually use this approach twice. Once we're going to do this to characterize the digital to analog converter, next we're going to use this to characterize the zero order hold cascaded with a plant. Okay, so those are the first two things. So the, both of these involve the use of a zero order hold and how does that affect a system? So first we're going to find the transfer function for a zero order hold, which sounds kind of weird, but anyway, we actually did this in EE314, but um, you may not have recalled how that looked. Anyway, delta kt enters our zero order hold so this is so part of what makes this weird is this is a discrete time input the output is a continuous time output so we actually have two different domains going here so when we call this the zero order hold of s uh, we're looking at it in terms of uh, delta here being in in essence a dirac delta function as opposed to a chronicler delta function so anyway this is what we're looking at so the input to the zero order hold is this delta. And basically, the zero order hold holds that value constant for um, holds it constant for the full sampling time. So, so this is one sampling period that, uh, that we get the pulse out. OK, so one full sampling period. And, and so we can look at this either as a Kronecker delta or a Dirac delta. Practically speaking, we're actually using it as a Kronecker delta. So if you recall the, the difference between the two, Kronecker delta is 1 at time 0 and 0 everywhere else. Okay, The Dirac delta is the one that has infinite magnitude but 0 width so that the integral is 1. Okay, So in a sense, we, we kind of use them somewhat interchangeably here. So that is, if we were to apply a Dirac delta function here, this would be our output. Okay, And so we treat this transfer function as if we had applied a Dirac delta, even though practically speaking we applied a Kronecker delta. Does that make sense? Okay. So anyway, the output that we get is this quantity in the Laplace domain. One, So we get a unit step, 
So that turn that's where it turns on. Okay, and then the the pulse turns off. So it's like a we're subtracting a time delayed unit step function. Okay, and so this is the time delayed version, and so this is the overall function that we get. So we can look at the zero order hold as having this transfer function. 1 minus e to the minus st divided by s. So we can look at it from a number of different ways. We can look at zero order hold here or this transfer function that we can we can look at these sample data systems. So we're basically going to again now when we look at open loop sample data system we're going to again apply a delta function at the input take the q transform of the output. And the result is the transfer function in the q domain. So when we apply a delta function at the input, so the output of the zero order hold is, is this function, and then this is the, tr the transfer function of the system, and so the output is just that product. So there's really a convolution going on, but it's, we get this product. And so we're now going to take the Q transform of that quantity. So the, the challenge of all of this is that um, the S domain is continuous time. The Q domain is, is discrete time. So we can't just like directly take the Q transform of something in the S domain, right? So if we want to take the Q transform of something, it has to be something in discrete time. This is not even, this is not even in time. This is in, in frequency. So, so what we mean when we say we're going to take the Q transform of this is we're going to take the inverse Laplace transform, sample it, and then take the Q transform of the resulting signal. Okay, so that's really what we mean when we, when we talk about this. Okay, so for a given transfer function, we now define this quantity, the Q transform of this, and that's P subscript H of Q. So notice it's related to P because it obviously involves P, but it also has the hold aspect to it, right? It has the hold transfer function, and so uh, we have that to consider as well. So the subscript H refers to the fact that the transfer function for the zero order hold is included in all of this. And so this is sometimes called the zero order hold transform. So, use, so this is the quantity for the zero order hold transform we can uh, use the integer time delay property of the Q transform. So notice this is a integer time delay. And so all of this can be can come out to be this. 1 minus Q divided by uh, times the Q transform of this quantity. All right, so that kind of simplifies it a little bit. So to kind of summarize a little bit, the H transform is the transform of a system not a signal. The H transform is an exact expression for the system at the sampling instance, the exact times of the sampling. Okay, In between samples, remember discrete time, we don't actually have any knowledge of what happens in between samples, but at the sampling times instance, we have, uh, this is an exact expression. In between sampling periods, the re response is lost. The system could be sampled with a period that is degenerative. We'll talk a little bit about that at the end. And finally, what's important to note is that the Q transform, that the zero order hold transform is not equal to the Q transform of the transfer function directly. So you can see there's a little bit of stuff that goes on in between. Okay, let's look at an example. So here's a transfer function we might have. And so we take that fu function, divide by S, we get this quantity. We perform partial fraction expansions. This is what we get when we do the partial fraction expansion. Okay, and so P of S over S is, is what we're working with when we take the H transform. And so that's what we called F of S. We already did the partial fraction expansion. So, I'm, so notice I'm taking the Q transform. Notice I'm still taking the Q transform. First thing I do is take the inverse Laplace transform of this. And um, so that's that's what we get. And now I sample that. So when I when I sample this, this is just minus three halves times the unit step function. So that's the same unit step function in discrete time. Here we have 
t times the unit step function. Here we have e to the minus 2t times the unit step function. So the first term, the q transform becomes this. The second term, the q transform becomes that. Third term, the q transform becomes this. And so I now put this all over a common denominator. And when I do, notice I'm going to have 1 minus q squared as a factor in the denominator. One of those is going to cancel with this 1 minus q. And so notice that our, even though this system here, even though this function here has three poles associated with it, two here, one here, the fact is that because of that cancellation, we end up with the same number of poles that we started with for the original plant. And that's, that's a characteristic. So even though we had this quantity here, this quantity will always cancel. One minus Q will always cancel with something. And that's because uh, we have P of S over S. That S is going to give a pole that's going to be, it's going to match this pole. Okay. So, and so all together we get all of this stuff. So notice this is the function that we get, and it's a function of the sampling time. So if we were to use a different sampling time, we would, you know, depending on what value of sampling time, we'll get a different actual expression in terms of Q. Okay. So you notice that first number of things, when we work with the Q domain, we always have our polynomials in ascending power as opposed to descending power. Okay, so this is just a uh, tr um, terminology that we use. So we have it ascending powers of Q. Okay, so so the, the constant terms appear first, and then terms in Q, and then um, that shouldn't say Q squared. That should just say Q. I don't know why that says that. Okay. Um, so that's an example. So the H transform now uh, has the property of linearity. So that is, if I have a sum of transfer functions that I'm working with, then the linearity property tells me I can take the H transform of each term separately. So in particular, what that means is, if I have a complex function for which I do not have a a term that I can work with easily, I can break it up into smaller pieces and work with the individual pieces and then combine everything when I'm all done. So the integer time delay property for the H transform follows just, just the same from the Q transform. For the non-integer time delay, uh, not so much. Okay, so, so we have that um, property. So for the H transform, that's important. Uh, for the non-integer time delay property, we have what's called the modified H transform, just like we have the modified Q transform for signals with time delay. Now, what's, what is this thing about degenerative sampling? So for degenerative sampling, um, here's an example. So here we have a transfer function, okay, uh, and and basically, the concept of degenerative sampling is aliasing for a system. So here we have this transfer function, the H transform of that, is all of this expression, for some constants A1 and A2, uh, which are somewhat hairy, so I'm, I'm not going to list them out here. Now, when we let t equal pi, now why would we let t equal pi? Okay, well, if I look over here, cosine of t. So when, when t is equal to pi, um, because this cosine has its, if, if you think in terms of the aliasing, or, or rather uh, the Nyquist frequency associated with this, uh, the Nyquist frequency about cosine of t, uh, the Nyquist frequency is pi. Okay, so when t is equal to pi, this becomes, cosine t becomes minus 1, so all of this gives me gives me repeated poles, okay? But in addition to give me repeated poles in the denominator, I also have this corresponding zero. So the, the numerator with these a1 and a2 uh, simplify down to something that has, has a pole zero cancellation, okay? So there's the, the pole and the zero that cancel one another. And so instead of having a second order transfer function, we actually only have a first-order transfer function. That is, we only have one pole in the system. 
We're going to look at now another representation for the system called the difference equation. The difference equation is a way of representing the, uh, a system. And so if we were to compare, for example, continuous time with discrete time, we would see that in continuous time we have dynamics, often described by differential equations. In discrete time we have them defined by difference equations. Our main transform for continuous time systems is the Laplace transform, and for discrete time systems it's the Q transform. Um, state models, we haven't really talked much about those, but we have them in various forms in, in discrete and continuous time. And then the transfer function, we have P of S as a continuous time transfer function, and as we've come up with, P subscript H of Q for our discrete time transfer function. Now the difference equation can actually be represented in a couple of different forms. So there's the forward difference, that is whenever we see K, we actually see uh, either K and, or a or um, the next value of k, all the way up to n minus uh, n, n values ahead. And uh, here we have these, these uh, inputs uh, for u. The input, the u is the forcing term, and notice we have various delayed versions of u, or uh, advanced versions of u. Uh, the more standard is the backward difference form. So instead of having um, positive terms added to our k. We have negative terms added to our k. And in general, we may have, we may have n terms involving the output y and m terms involving the input of the system u. Now, here I'm using u and y as input and out, uh, u as input, y as output. Um, but you can, <clears throat> because the transfer function can have whatever input and whatever output names, um, we, these things carry over. Now, when we actually have a a backward difference form like this, we can have associated with it initial conditions. So these are the first n values of the output y and the first n or the you know the most recent n values or the first n values of the input u. And these initial conditions uniquely define the overall response. So just like with the differential equation you have initial conditions. So we have that. Or we can work with prior conditions. So prior conditions mean these are conditions before time zero for both u and y. We keep track of m prior conditions. If our system is initially at rest, then all of our initial conditions are, or rather, all of our prior conditions are zero. So in general, we have a difference equation. Here is a very simple form of the difference equation. y of k is equal to y of k, the previous value, and then the value just before that. This uh, particular difference equation defines something called a Fibonacci sequence. A Fibonacci sequence starts with has uses this as its difference equation, and it starts with these initial conditions: y at zero is equal to y at one, which is one. So these are the initial conditions. So the Fibonacci sequence, it turns out, is a sequence that is abundantly found in creation. It describes the population growth of rabbits. It describes the spiral of a nautilus, it describes the branching in trees, it describes the fruitlets of a pineapple, um, all kind of, you know, the, the arrangements of the seeds in a, in a sunflower, sunflower and so forth, all kinds of things like that. So this Fibonacci sequence is an important mathematical sequence that defines a lot of things in nature. So to see how, how this works, we start, here's our difference equation, here are our initial conditions. So notice we already know the first two values of y, and so how do we find the values beyond that? Well, for k greater than or equal to 2. So when k is equal to 2, so we notice that I just let k equal 2 here. So this becomes k of 1, this one becomes 0. So k minus 2 is, for 2, is 0. k minus 1 is 1. So we already know that these initial condition values are both 1, and so they, they give this. y at 3 is actually the sum of the previous two values. So the previous two values are 2 and 1, and so forth. Okay, so basically, the value at time k is the sum of the previous two values. So we start off with 1 and 1, so we get 2. 2 and 1 is 3. 3 and 2 is 5. 5 and 3 is 8. 8 and 5 is 13, and so forth. So you can see it's actually a growing, it's an increasing sequence.
just like the the spirals of the Nautilus get bigger and bigger as they you know it goes around kind of thing. So that's the uh, that's an example of a difference equation. In general, we might have a difference equation like this. This is the the general first order difference equation. It's forced. That we, that means we have an input term. Here we we assume initial condition. For example, this. Um, so now we want to find what is the general expression for y for all k given this. Okay, so here's our difference equation, initial condition. Okay, so we iterate from k equals from k equals one. So when y is equal to one, uh, when k is equal to one, y is given by this expression. So y at one is equal to a times y at zero plus b times y, u at zero. I don't know what b, b uh, what u at zero is. Okay, so I'm going to leave it as a variable. But I know what y at zero is. It's one. Okay, so um, y at time two now, just using this equation, becomes a times y at one, b times u at one. y at one we solved in the previous step. It's given by this expression. And so we have this expression. And uh, so notice here I haven't actually substituted in the value of the initial condition. So this is the form that we get. And y at 3 now is equal to a times y at 2 plus b times y at u at 2. And so y at 2 is given by all of this stuff. So when we plug all of this into here, we get this expression and so forth. And so we notice that as we, as we go on, the index here, 3, becomes the power of a. And then we have descending powers of a from there. Okay. And so we can actually go through and show that the general solution to this difference equation is given by this expression. So notice it has a term involving the initial condition, then it has this sum that involves the input terms, and this is, ta-da, a convolution sum. So we knew convolution had to come in here somewhere, and this is exactly how it comes out. So we, did, we haven't actually plugged our initial condition. So here, even though we have an initial condition established, we don't we, this is still the same form we have regardless of what that initial value is. So this is our, our difference equation. So it turns out that many of the discrete time signals can be represented by a difference equation. In fact, all of the signals in the Q transform table can be represented by difference equations. Um, and so just as differential equations can be solved using transforms, so difference equations can be solved using transforms. So just by way of example, to show that a signal can be represented by a difference equation, we, we start with a signal, r of kt is equal to 3, a to the power k, cosine of vk. So this is a discrete time signal. Notice I, even though I say kt here, um, I don't have explicit dependence upon k in here. So this could be, for example, a could be e to the minus 3t, b could be, you know, pi over 2, times t or whatever so. okay so I know this I know this and I know this okay I, all I'm doing is substituting in for k I'm substituting in k minus 1 and k minus 2 okay and now when I actually combine them this way this is a linear combination of these three terms so r of k minus 2a that's just a constant times cosine of b that's just a constant times r of k minus 1. And then plus a squared r of k minus 2. So again, this is just a constant times r of k minus 2. So when I plug it in this way, it turns out I can I can factor out a to the power k out of all of these terms. And actually, I, I can factor out a 3 out of all these terms. And I get this expression, so these cosine things. And I can go through and show by a trig identity that for all values of k, this is in fact equal to 0. So we actually have a difference equation that represents this signal. And that signal can be represented by a difference equation. So now how does a transfer function relate to a difference equation? Well, we saw that a, a transfer, uh, that a, ba a backward difference form of the difference equation can be written this way. So if I take this, this uh, difference, so notice I have y of k plus the next past value of y all the way down to the, the, uh, the nth 
past value of y. And that's a linear combination of u and past values of u. So that's the basic difference equation. Because I'm looking at past values of y and u, I can use the integer time delay property of the Q transform. So the integer time delay property. So taking the Q transform of this just gives me y of Q. This is given by this, and I'm taking now the, the, Q, uh, the Q transform of this then becomes Q y of Q. The Q transform of this, this is delayed n times. I get Q to the n y of Q. And I do the same kind of thing with the other side. I just take the, the Q transform term by term. That becomes U of Q. This becomes Q times U of Q. This becomes Q to the M times U of Q. So, so we get, we get these uh, terms coming out. I can now factor on the left Y of Q. And on the right, I can factor U of Q. And now I basically solve for the ratio Y over U. Okay. And so I, this, this goes down on under this side, and this goes down under that side, and I get this expression. So we get a transfer function in Q. So that transfer function is uniquely related to that differential equation. We saw step by step how we went from the uh, difference equation to the uh, transfer function. Okay. So if I start with the transfer function, I can easily go back to the difference equation. I just reverse the steps. So I would take this equation, for example, cross multiply. I would distribute, so instead of factoring, I would distribute y through here, distribute u through here. And notice I'm going to have powers of q times y. When I take the inverse q transform, I'm going to get uh, you know, delayed values of y using, again, the integer time delay property. So I can go directly back and forth between a transfer function and a difference equation. So how would we use the difference equation? Well, the difference equation is actually how a controller is implemented. So here we have a, a one degree of freedom controller. That is, we have one input coming into our controller and uh, we have an output. Okay. And so suppose our controller is given by this transfer function. All right. So we know that that transfer function is related to this difference equation. Notice that I have u's here appearing here because now u is our output instead of our input. And in our input here is E, what we call E. And so we have this difference equation that's associated with that uh, transfer function. Okay. So now I'm going to take that equation. I'm going to solve for U in terms of the, the U at time K in terms of the past values of U and E and its past values of E. The pat here I use the past N values of U, past M values of E. Okay. So... I, I keep track of the uh, I, I keep track of e and its past values, u and its past values. I only need to keep track of n past values of u and m past values of e. Okay, so I can actually take this equation now and write it in a vector form. So if you remember matrix multiplication, you multiply by a, a row by a column. Each element in the row multiplies every element in the column. So we can write that this way. So the first term becomes like this, this times that, and now I'm going to subtract this times that. And so I can vectorize my equation, and so u of k is equal to this. So once we get the e, the most recent value of e, I can plug it in here, and I can do this multi multiplication and subtraction, and I can get my next value of the control. So each time the control is calculated based on the error and the, um, the past values of, the, of E and the past values of U. So this is how I can actually implement a controller. Okay, so basically you would do this within a loop. Okay, you would do this with each time through the loop, you would, you would uh, grab the value, the, the next value of the input, you would plug it in here, you would perform this calculation, that would give you U, and that would give you the, the, the next control value. So we can now implement a control using this. So this is actually, so keep in mind what, what's actually happening here is a convolution. And that's actually what we're doing when we do all of this. We're actually doing that convolution. Um, in this case, it's, it's a little more complicated than that simple example that I showed, but it's still a full-blown con convolution. So we were able to use uh, the transforms and the transfer function in order to
help us to implement all that. So this is the H transform and discrete time systems. Thanks for watching.